Maria, if you can unmute yourself and come back on camera. Sina as well, please. Sina. There you are. All right. Wait for Michelle here. Should I keep my camera on when we start and then turn it off again? Just one moment, please. All right, Marie, you can go off camera. Senna, you may begin. Well, hi everyone. Uh, uh, good morning or night, depending on where you are. Uh, thanks for coming to our tutorial. This is a tutorial that I will be presenting with uh, Maria de Ortega, uh, who I don't think you can see right now, but you will see her in the uh, next part of the tutorial. So this is a translation tutorial, uh, translating some of the research on diversity, of uh, sociocultural diversity, from philosophy, cognitive science, and some parts of organizational research to the context of uh, machine learning. Now, social cultural diversity, of course, is a key value in uh, many democratic societies and for many different reasons, justice, equity, and for ramifications that it might have for the performance of collectives, whether these are small collectives like deliberative mini publics and juries or larger collectives such as political or uh, scientific communities. Now, uh, Given this importance of diversity, of course, it's uh, an increased use of machine learning system in our societies. It's not very surprising that there's an interest in uh, social cultural diversity among machine learning researchers as well. This interest typically takes uh, two types of forms. Uh, one form, the idea is that well, machine learning systems interact with society. They, the data sets that we get come from society and the output of machine learning systems, the decisions that are guided or driven by them are going to impact society. So in many allocation uh, settings, the benefits and burdens that falls on individuals, the advantages and resources that they might get in hiring, for instance, are shaped by these systems. The recommendations of news are shaped by them and our romantic ties and other types of social ties uh, might be shaped by them through dating apps. So, uh, the idea here is that uh, diversity, given that these machine learning systems uh, are going to impact society, we should take diversity as a design desideratum uh, in the way that we construct a, a machine learning system. And so this is the same way that we take uh, performance, different senses of performance as a design desideratum or more recently fairness in technical work on uh, uh, incorporating fairness by design. So this is one strand of diversity and the paper by uh, Marina Druso provides a kind of nice overview of some of the work that has been done here. But there's another strand too. As you can already see, of course, machine learning systems don't operate outside of society, right? The construction pipeline of these systems takes place in uh, organizational and uh, in, uh, organizations and institutions that are socially positioned, they're within society. And so uh, a second line of research uh, notices the social position of the people, uh, individuals and organizations that develop these models. And uh, they suggest uh, that uh, diversity, particularly organizational or team diversity can be a solution or a partial solution to designing better systems, particularly systems that don't exhibit harmful biases that uh, have been a matter of much discussion in recent years. Uh, and I say partial solution because most of the people that say this, of course, they, they, they don't think that there are not other problems. Uh, they don't think that there are not uh, sometimes social reforms required, sometimes technical solution. But the idea is that organizational diversity can uh, address some aspects of the problems uh, that we face in light of algorithmic bias. Now, there are two kind of challenges here. Uh, on the one hand, uh, with research on diversity as a design desideratum, one challenge is that, or one issue is that, much of the research starts with uh, 
constructing some measure of diversity or some diversity measure, sometimes transporting it from other areas of uh, uh, computer science, like work on information retrieval, and then designing algorithms uh, or coming up with ways for satisfying them or enforcing those diversity measures. What makes it problematic in the context of sociocultural diversity is that it makes it unclear sometimes, this focus on quantitative measures from the beginning makes it unclear sometimes what the conception or meaning or sense of diversity uh, at issue is and uh, why it's valued. And diversity has different meanings, right? This matters because not only does diversity has different meanings, but it, each of those meanings are connected to different types of rationales. So before constructing a measure, it's typically good to be clear about in what sense uh, of diversity are we interested in? Why, why are we pursuing diversity in that sense? A second issue that sometimes comes up in uh, some of the statements uh, or declarations about how organizational or team diversity can generate uh, better ML products uh, that are not susceptible to biases is a lack of specificity in the precise mechanism by which these potential benefits of diversity are supposed to come about. And uh, this is, can be problematic because uh, of course, when we lack a specificity, uh, the hypothesis that we come up with can be uninformative or kind of easily falsifiable. And it makes experimental design as well as inferences from experimental results quite difficult. And I think one danger also is that sometimes making these general statements, even when people say this is a partial solution, can result in kind of detrimental expectations about uh, what diversity can do for us, uh, as if like it can magically solve a certain types of things. So we need to be clear about this. And uh, these are some of the questions, the questions about what are the different meanings of uh, diversity? Uh, what are the rationales behind them? And uh, what are the different pathways by which diversity uh, can impact group performance are questions that uh, researchers from philosophy, cognitive science and organizational research and many others have uh, looked at. And so the aim of our tutorial is to translate some of the uh, knowledge in those disciplines to the context of machine learning. Uh, before I begin my part, I, I want to make two <laughs> quick notes. The first one is that the diversity research is really vast. Uh, I mean, the notion of diversity, as I said, there's uh, diversity in general, uh, not just social cultural diversity is in computer science. Uh, there is, uh, it's in biodiversity and ecology, uh, information sciences, libraries, uh, philosophy, psychology. So my knowledge is very restricted and it's very, Kind of comes from I come from a background in philosophy and cognitive science and uh, my academic interest at my research interest uh, in the uh, question was instigated by particularly by works in feminist philosophy of science and social uh, social epistemology and uh, these researchers emphasize the situ socially situated nature of knowledge and the value laden of uh, knowledge uh, production and the idea is that uh, given this social situationness, uh, uh, we should not only look at uh, what individuals are doing or how they're behaving or how they ought to behave, but we should also look at the norms for uh, at a community level, how we organize uh, our epistemic. This is a word that I use a lot and philosophers use epistemic. It just means knowledge related. You can think about it in that way. How uh, we, we should organize and structure uh, our knowledge seeking communities, for instance, in science. And of course, diversity is a key issue that has been discussed there in the past few decades. And there is, I also have interest in the strands of uh, research in empirical and computational cognitive science that uses experiments and simulations and uh, other formal tools for studying the impacts of diversity in some sense. And in my work, I have worked on both of these things and have also tried to bridge the, the gap between them. But the point is, I, there are many things that I don't know. And uh, I, maybe in Q&A, people have uh, excellent ideas about how this relates to other things. The second note that I want to make is that when we talk uh, about the positive impact of diversity, the positive potential positive consequence of diversity, we are really thinking about how diversity teams can result in better products, 
in a way that can inform hypothesis uh, generation and testing in the context of ML. To put it more bluntly, we are not and don't want to, and I, I, and I want to say nobody should <laughs> make a business case for diversity. That is a case in which diversity should be valued because of this type of benefits. Why is that? Because this type of business case takes place against a quite problematic uh, moral background. It ignores other important uh, aims that we have for valuing diversity, social aims uh, such as justice, organizational aims. And uh, it implicitly takes a lack of diversity as a default that doesn't need justification. You never see a business case for homogeneity, for instance, right? And that also means that it puts the burden on individuals from minority groups to kind of prove themselves in a way, right? They have to be there to somehow, they have to generate some sort of benefit. So this is not the case that we are making and this is a quite problematic uh, case. So in part one, the questions that I look at is that what are the different uh, ways of understanding? What are some different ways of understanding diversity? Why might we value them uh, in each of these senses? And uh, what are some of the pathways by which diversity can be can provide potential benefits? So let's just start by these different senses, different concepts of diversity. And here I draw from joint work that I've done with uh, Dan Steele, uh, Kinley Gillett, uh, Bianca Crew, and Michael Burgess. Uh, and you can look at the paper I, I heavily draw from this paper. So I, I acknowledge uh, their fantastic work. So uh, diversity in a kind of a general sense uh, implies some sort of difference. And depending on how we understand that notion of difference, we will get different, let's say, perception of diversity. In the most obvious case, you might think that we might have a collective that uh, according to one set of attributes, we might think is diverse, let's say diverse from a perspective of gender diversity, but it's not diverse from a perspective of other attributes. So in this case, we are changing the attribute and that's what is changing our perception of diversity. And there's a kind of a large research here that typically tries to look at different types of attributes because well, individuals differ from each other along many different dimensions. And so this strand of research tries to figure out what are the axes of diversity and how they relate to each other at what different levels. And there are many different distinctions here and it's kind of useful, uh, well, very useful, especially if you're concerned with uh, uh, anticipating whether these differences that we are making actually make a difference in the world to the perception of individual and how they change, for instance, group dynamics. But this is not the sense of diversity that, that I have in mind here, this notion of just changing the attributes. So we can make a difference between a uh, context of diversity, concepts of diversity and measures of diversity. So what is the context? Context, let's take it as a kind of a background situation that among other things, suggests a set of relevant attributes for assessing diversity, let's say of a group. The focus here mainly will be on groups. Given a context, then we can talk about the concept of diversity, which we can define as an understanding of what constitutes diversity abstracted from the question of uh, what the uh, attributes are. So given a set of attributes, we can have different concepts of diversity. And I will talk more about this. And given the concept of diversity, we can have different measures. Uh, so a measure of diversity will be a kind of a mathematical operationalization uh, for quantifying the extent of diversity in some sense, uh, according to some concept of diversity. So kind of a very toy, simple example so I'm Iranian Canadian and uh, I moved to Canada, immigrated to Canada uh, after high school. And one festival that was uh, uh, during the time that I was in Toronto, one festival that uh, there is in Toronto is this Tirgan festival that uh, celebrates uh, Iranian culture. It's organized typically by Iranians, Iranian Canadians. And so of course it's very popular among uh, the population of Iranians in Canada or Iranian Canadians. So let's take the kind of ethnocultural origin. Uh, I'm using a term uh, from Stats Canada. Uh, I mean, it's a general term, but uh, the distinctions from Stats Canada. Let's take the ethnocultural origin of festival goers 
sorry, that should be festival goers as our attributes. Is this group of attendees uh, diverse? Now, there are different ways that we can answer this question. One answer might be just say no, because it's not kind of balanced, right? It's heavily skewed towards Iranians, uh, the audience in the, uh, in the festival. Another way that we can answer is say, well, no, but this time our reason is different. No, because the, the, this collection of attendees is not representative of uh, Toronto's, let's say, ethnocultural composition. Or we can say yes, because in contrast with the majority of cultural events in Toronto, where, which is, could be dom dominated uh, with people from a kind of white European uh, backgrounds, uh, this group is different. So in that sense, it's diverse. So notice that there are different, uh, these, uh, with, even with the same attributes, there are different senses of diversity and there are different ways that we can assess the diversity of a group. So in the simplest case, uh, we can uh, just, uh, when we have a set of attributes, we can look at the kind of a group distribution and uh, assess the diversity of the group. And we call this a within group concept of diversity. And the most uh, maybe the, a straightforward uh, understanding of a within group concept is egalitarian concepts. So according to an, a strict egalitarian concept of diversity, a group will be diverse to the extent that all the attribute categories, in that case, uh, ethnocultural origin, are present in equal proportions in the group. Now notice that this concept of diversity is kind of symmetric. If we change uh, Iranian uh, with, let's say, Chinese, it doesn't make any difference to our perception of diversity, and it's maximal at equality. And uh, so there are different measures for this, like Shannon entropy, blah index, there are different measures that are used to uh, operationalize some sense of this concept, and they put different emphasis on breadth uh, of attributes or the distributional evenness. And uh, you can look at the Scott Page's book for review of this type of measures. Now, uh, notice that uh, this type of egalitarian diversity concept uh, ignores the extent of differences between attributes. And if that is something that we want, uh, some people suggest a different uh, diversity con concept. Some, uh, like Harrison and Klein calls it uh, diversity as difference. And that tries to uh, uh, measure the extent of difference between different attributes. And then the collective will be, let's say, diverse if either the average or the minimal difference is uh, large and typically depends on having a meaningful distance or similarity function whereby we can judge the relation between attributes. There are debates about whether this is really a different diversity concept or should we think about it as a kind of a weighting or evaluation on an egalitarian notion of diversity. It doesn't matter for our purposes, it depends on aims and context. Uh, but why might someone kind of value diversity in this sense, right? So there are different rationales. One ethical rationale is uh, kind of ideas of egalitarian or equal, uh, ideas of equality, that we should kind of have equal respect for different, uh, uh, let's say, perspectives, different uh, groups, different values and norms, right? Uh, but there are also epistemic rationales. And the idea here is that the variety in perspectives and interests can be epistemically beneficial, can be good for the group. So Miriam Solomon, philosopher, for instance, say that pursuit of various projects on uh, non-empirical grounds. That is like, if people uh, have different interests, it can be good for science. Similarly, Helen Longino uh, says that uh, when we have a group that is diverse in this sense, it uh, reduces the risk that some of the assumptions that we are making would go unnoticed and uh, on questions or unchallenged. And similarly, Hong and Page in another context is show the uh, benefit of this sense of diversity for uh, balancing exploration exploitation in problem solving context. So there are different ways of uh, different reasons why we might value this. Now notice that with these within group uh, concepts are only focused on a focal group and they're as I said they're symmetric in most popular uh, operationalization in the sense that it doesn't matter what uh, attribute means what actually in the population. So it tends to ignore uh, how the majority in the group this majority in the this group distribution actually relates to the population in general, as well as uh, in what type of social dynamics it's implicated. To capture those things, we can uh, 
consider other concepts of diversity. These are, we call them comparative concepts of diversity. And for these concepts, in addition to knowing something about the group distribution of your focal group whose diversity is at issue, you can also you need also to have a reference population against which you're comparing this. And this comparison can go in different ways. So in one sense, the obvious sense is the representative notion of diversity. So you want your kind of this collection to be representative of uh, the reference population that you have. Right. And of course, the choice of reference population matters because it can change the extent to which the group is representative of or not. And this comes up a lot in discussions of diversity of viewpoints in journalism, for instance. So Phil Jacklin says there is representative diversity when the political diversity in communications is representative of political diversity in the total society. And here the total society is uh, our reference population. Now, again, there are different uh, rationales for this. Ethical rationales for this typically come from uh, ideas of participatory democracy and representative democracy. There are also epistemic rationales, uh, typically in terms of uh, opinions. Uh, and the idea here sometimes is that when, let's say, a community has good evidence, uh, let's say experts on climate change, then it makes no sense to make sure that every op opinion is evenly uh, uh, presented, but we should actually, uh, the opinions that we sample should be representative of actual expertise, because otherwise we might just give, uh, uh, what is it called, the microphone or give opportunity for people that whose opinions are actually not supported by evidence to uh, cast doubt on scientific results. Another comparative notion is nor these normic concepts. And this is a term that uh, my colleague Dan Steele coined. Uh, so these normic concepts are different. They are also defined in relation to a group, but they're defined, they're kind of a, a, a little bit more morally in some sense substantive. They're defined in relation to a non-diverse category. And uh, the group, uh, that we are focusing on is diverse to the extent that it diverges or does not fall into the category. Or we can also define it in terms of uh, a particular distribution that we want, and then the group will be diverse insofar as it matches that other intended category. So when we do that, uh, notice that uh, in this sense, we can also talk about diverse individuals. So in the previous two senses, it doesn't really make sense to talk about diverse individuals, but it, here it makes sense because insofar as they don't fall into the non-diverse category, an individual can be assumed diverse. And so here's some result of diverse doctor on my Google search. And uh, examples of uh, discussions of this in the literature, uh, Sandra Harding says, uh, so what is the diversity on which I focus here? Uh, one central concern is to include in scientific decision making the groups that uh, had heretofore have been excluded from participating in decisions. So this is kind of uh, the notion that it's a particular groups that have been excluded and in contrast with groups that, uh, let's say, white males that have typically driven the research. And Harding contrasts this uh, with uh, what she calls mere diversity which according to her would require including a wide range of political perspective, including oppressive ones. And notice that this is, uh, so uh, shows the tension, potential tension between normic and uh, uh, egalitarian notions, right? So uh, normic notions in terms of measure, you can potentially use many divergence measures. Uh, of course, you have to go through the construction of them, but there's, there's been less work on operationalizations uh, in uh, practice, uh, and we can talk about why that might be. Sometimes I think implicitly it's assumed in terms of weighting on within group notions of diversity, but it's typically not made completely explicit. Uh, and I think Maria will discuss this. There's a paper by Meg Mitchell actually in the context of ML, that I think provides a measure that captures something like this normic concept of diversity. So what are the rationales for this? Uh, again, there are ethical rationales that are clear, such as social justice, anti-oppression and domination, but there are also epistemic rationales. So uh, particularly in a standpoint theory, uh, the idea is that certain types of a standpoint can have 
uh, kind of a privileged uh, access uh, to the working of the system. They might have a privileged epistemic access, uh, such that it would allow them to kind of uh, get a better sense, a more accurate understanding of the working of unjust uh, power structures uh, that is not kind of occluded by being part of the oppressive group. Uh, and I should say here that just a standpoint is not the same thing as the perspective that I mentioned in the egalitarian notion. A standpoint, typically a standpoint theorist think is something more substantive. So I, I don't have a, like a perspective of an Iranian or a standpoint of an Iranian or like Middle Eastern just by vir virtue of being born there, but you have to actually engage in political projects and develop that standpoint. Now, there are many different concepts uh, of course, there, we can always uh, hybridize them, mix them, but it's very important uh, not to conflate them. So in uh, terms of uh, uh, mixing these, we discuss one in our paper, uh, in the case of uh, deliberative mini publics on uh, human tissue biobanking about how uh, particularly uh, egalitarian concepts can be uh, hybridized with normic concepts given the context, but we need to be clear about our rationales. Uh, in terms of conflation, the worry particularly is that uh, some measures and some senses of diversity are very prevalent in the literature. For instance, egalitarian uh, concepts and Lau index or sometimes Gini Simpson index are very popular ways of operationalizing this, but sometimes their use is driven by convention as opposed to uh, actual suitability to the purpose that the researcher has. And that can lead to certain problems. So here's one example of how this can be problematic. So in a meta-analysis of empirical findings on uh, impact of gender and uh, racial di uh, ethnic diversity. So researchers find that in uh, teams diversity uh, is more likely to generate negative effects when in predominantly male settings compared to settings in which it's closer. It's not completely gender balanced, of course, but it's closer to gender balance. From this, the researchers infer the claim that the negative effects of gender and race, ethni uh, et, uh, race ethnicity diversity is weaker in more gender balanced and ethnically balanced settings respectively. But notice that from that result, you cannot really directly infer this claim because it's ambiguous between two interpretation. That is, is the observed effect due to homogeneity? That is just because there was, uh, uh, we were far away from the balance or is it because of the a strong numerical majority of the socially dominant groups? That is, for instance, in the male dominant group. Do we see the same things in groups that are female dominant? And in uh, some research actually shows that no, the, the effects of diversity in those groups is not, uh, those negative effects uh, do not happen often. So it's important to keep these things uh, separate, but overall the key points, there are different concepts of diversity and they are associated with distinct explanations for why diversity is valuable. It's important to clarify which concept uh, is relevant to us at each point and why, what is the justification. And it's important to keep in mind uh, when we are in interpreting empirical results. And this is something that typically comes up because particularly for measures that are symmetric, they cannot, uh, I mean, just to give a kind of a forced uh, toy example, they cannot distinguish between groups that are 20% uh, male and 20% female uh, versus the other way around, and that can be problematic. Uh, so that was part one. Part two, uh, what are the pathways by which diversity can produce kind of beneficial effect for group performance? And here I uh, draw on some, some of the literature review uh, that I did for um, my two papers with, uh, again, Dan Steele and Dan, Dan and Bianca and Kindy. Uh, so one thing that uh, researchers, uh, many kind of meta-analysis uh, remind us is that diversity, social cultural diversity can impact both positively and negatively groups in many different ways. So their pathways of uh, consequences are many. And a core lesson from meta-analysis that put things together is that uh, we need to be very clear about what is the particular mechanism under investigation. And so some researchers call this, uh, we should be clear about uh, our specific input process output model. So diversity, what is the process and what is the particular output? So let's look at just two of these potential pathways by which diversity can produce uh, benefits. Uh, 
one we can call it cognitive pathway the idea is that uh, the diversity can be beneficial uh, by somehow uh, broadening the range of uh, cognitive attributes of group members another one we can call information elaboration or ie pathways and these are the, the idea here is that the potential positive effects of uh, diversity is mediated by uh, diversity's influence on how uh, groups interact with each other, or how information dispersed in the group is elicited and examined. So the cognitive pathway, the core idea, uh, as I said, it can be beneficial by broadening the team's cognitive repertoire. And so this is important because uh, particularly if the task is difficult, no individual can actually solve it by themselves. If the uh, individuals in the group are similar to each other, their abilities are correlated and their limitations uh, overlap with each other. So they, fa they face the same type of problems. And the idea is that cognitive diversity can help the group with that. And the pathway is that uh, the suggestion is that demographic diversity can benefit group performance by this mediation if it induces uh, cognitive diversity. And two things are very important here, of course, is that these are just a set of pa pathways. This is not just one pathway. The particular pathway here depends on what the task is, problem solving, prediction, and uh, innovation, and what are the particular cognitive abilities or resources like information that is required there. But at the general level, one thing that is very important here is uh, task type and complexity. So it's very important, uh, particularly these effects come when the task is complex enough. So as in some example, research has found that uh, diversity in observable attributes like ethnicity and nationality uh, may affect, so can affect, because as we will see, there are other findings too, uh, cognitive outcomes in a positive way. So the number of alternative ideas or quality of ideas or degree of cooperation. And similarly, uh, there's research in um, that uh, looks at outcomes like uh, citation index as a proxy for the quality of scientific work. And they find that in more uh, in publications with uh, gender heterogeneous uh, authorship, they receive more citations. And the idea is that more citations indicates that the quality is higher. So one question that is arises here, and there's a matter of kind of debate in literature sometimes is whether this cognitive pathway is the only positive way, uh, uh, positive, uh, the only way by which sociocultural diversity or identity diversity can positively impact task performance. So some people seem to uh, think yes. For instance, as Scott Page in his book uh, says that for cognitive diversity to produce a bonus, it must be germane to the task. The same logic applies to identity diversity. And he goes on to say that, uh, for women by virtue of being women to create immediate diversity bonuses, their cognitive repertoire, their knowledge, information, mental models, heuristics should be relevant to the task. So the idea is that if there is no task relevance, if there is no correlation between identity and task relevant uh, attributes, then we might not uh, perceive the benefits of uh, sociocultural diversity. But is this true? Uh, there's Another strand of research that suggests that this is not true. Uh, and the idea here is that the same way that cognitive uh, identity diversity or sociocultural diversity can uh, kind of go beyond the cognitive limits of individual, here identity diversity at the group level can contract detrimental group influence on how information is elicited and examined in groups. And one, uh, for instance, one uh, detrimental group influence that is very important in this research is the impact of conformity. So when we change our belief or behavior in response to real or imagined group influence. And uh, there are many different reasons for conformity. There's this video, but uh, we, do, we don't have time to go through that video. Uh, one, one type of influences that uh, derive conformity behavior uh, is sometimes called informational influences. So it's kind of uh, individuals want to be right. Uh, they want to get the word accurately. And uh, when the word is complex and the individuals are uncertain, they rely on other sources. And uh, so this re results in uh, a change in belief. And this can, uh, the effect of this uh, 
type of influences can be uh, moderated by task difficulty, subjective uncertainty, and perceived ability of others. And this is going to be important. Another type of influence is called uh, normative influences. And so this is sometimes called, uh, 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 is motivated by the desire to be liked. So I want to be liked by my own group. So even if I have an opinion and I'm certain of it, I might not voice it because I'm worried that I will be uh, excluded by others and I want, to, I want them to like me. And uh, this really impacts the decision-making part. So it doesn't necessarily change my belief about what is right or wrong, but it might change what I voice publicly, right? And researchers have also mentioned another thing that kind of falls between these two things. It's called referent informational influences. This is similar to informational influences in the sense that we can change belief. And the tie really is here that uh, socially similar others as, are somehow seen as more kind of epistemically uh, similar and reliable. So uh, I might more easily revise what I know or change what I believe in light of what uh, similar others tell me. How do these uh, relate to diversity? These kind of suggest two uh, types of sub-mechanisms for uh, how information uh, elaboration pathway uh, can be uh, expanded. So one is the trust pathway. The idea here is that diversity contracts the detrimental effects of reference information of group influences. So instead of me just taking what my in-group uh, colleagues say uh, as uh, for granted and just changing uh, what I believe in light of that, uh, I might be a bit more diligent in the way that I process information. Uh, I might actually uh, not be too lax. And there is also the normative pathway uh, or conformative pathway. And the, the idea here is that diversity allows individuals, lessens uh, uh, the pressure to conform, the normative pressure to conform, allows individual to voice dissenting views. So if I'm not as worried about uh, my group members excluding me, then I might voice my opinion and then consider novel views. And then there are evidence for both of these things. So there's this nice paper by Sarah Gator that shows that uh, the reference informational uh, uh, conformity can be reduced in a way that individuals make better decisions in diverse group. And uh, they suggest that this is because uh, in homogeneous groups, uh, that is primarily white in that context, uh, individuals were more likely to reconsider their original decision. And or the original decision here was on an easy task. So the original decision was a good decision. Uh, and uh, so by not easily changing the idea, uh, their opinion, they make better decision. And there are similar results that uh, shows that uh, diversity in these senses can foster greater scrutiny and uh, uh, of the result. And there's also work that shows that, uh, work by Catherine Phillips that shows that uh, diversity in this sense uh, can uh, enable contestation. So individuals voice their opinion. And also sometimes when in groups uh, side without groups, they might work harder to convince other in groups. So there's the motivation to restore ties. Uh, but there's something interesting here that the diverse groups, even though they're perform better, individuals in these groups report less confidence in their performance sometimes and perceive their interactions as less effective. And this already points us towards some of the worries that sometimes arise in the context of diversity in the sense that overall effect of it might not be positive. So research meta-analysis typically find uh, between cognitive diversity and group performance, there's typically a small positive association but with demographic diversity and group performance, typically the relation is highly contextual and it ranges from positive to sometimes even slightly negative. And there are some research, uh, some papers that show these findings. One explanation for it is that uh, research is using different measures. Uh, so if you use more objective task oriented measures, uh, actually these findings will disappear. And if you use more subjective things like uh, individuals uh, feelings uh, whether they're kind of uh, they thought that they're, they're happy or uh, especially supervisor performance ratings those biases emerge and it will make it uh, as if uh, look as if uh, diverse groups are performing worse uh, but there are other reasons uh, so these uh, 
these reasons, uh, these papers uh, uh, in the context of gender diversity show that this, uh, the evidence uh, and the paper by Bear and Woolley, they say this contingent upon a variety of contextual factors, some of which actually comes in this other paper by Byron and Post, uh, they find positive impact of diversity. And, uh, but importantly, they say, as they say, this uh, positive impacts is particularly higher in national context when boards may be more motivated to draw on resources that women directors bring to board. So there's kind of that respect and motivation. And in contexts where uh, intra-board power distributions might be more balanced. So overall, the, the idea is that diversity's overall impact are a number of key modifiers. And uh, I strongly suggest uh, reading this piece uh, uh, by Professor Phillips, uh, who unfortunately passed away last year uh, and has been very influential on my work. And uh, this is a postscript to uh, Scott Page's book and I highly recommend it. But some of the key modifiers here are diversity, having a diversity mindset. So you have to be in a group where group members are actually open to social differences. Uh, demographic distribution, the group is less homogeneous or less unbalanced to begin with which you can imagine that there are also many other compounder here. Power dynamic, the group uh, must be more egalitarian as opposed to hierarchical. And there should be organizational leadership support, uh, so inclusive and supportive uh, work environment. Uh, so key points uh, before we take the break, examining diversity's positive uh, potential benefits uh, requires thinking about what is the particularly relevant mechanism. Uh, what is the task that we are thinking about? Uh, what is the complexity of it? If it's a routine task, an individual can do it and even having group might not be beneficial. Is there interaction between individuals? And uh, overall diversity's impact can be varies with context and measure it also. It's important to pay attention to contextual uh, factors and, but the positive impact can also be small. And so it's important as many researchers have said don't expect diversity magic and don't tie the value of diversity to its epistemic benefit. That is, don't uh, make the business case for it. Don't put the value there because there are so many values for diversity and diversity can be beneficial, but depends on all these other things. And research shows that the, these epistemic benefits are more likely to emerge in contexts that typically value diversity on other grounds, on justice, respect, uh, inclusion. So time for a break uh, and we will be back with Maria. Oh, I should say that uh, we are taking a five minute break. So if you want to uh, grab a glass of water uh, before Maria starts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I will be presenting the second part of the tutorial on social cultural diversity in machine learning. And in this part, we will situate on we will situate the discussion of the concepts and consequences of diversity that Fina introduced in part one and draw its implications for research in machine learning. I am Maria Arteaga. I'm an assistant professor in the Information Risk and Operations Management Department at the McComb School of Business at UT Austin. So the questions that we will focus on in this part of the tutorial are where and how is social cultural diversity relevant in the machine learning life cycle? Why are concepts of diversity important in this context? How can a taxonomy of diversity, such as the one that Sina introduced, a taxonomy of concepts of diversity, help us characterize the literature that has come out in recent years on diversity and machine learning? And why is it important to specify pathways of the benefits of diversity in machine learning? When viewing the machine learning life cycle, and in particular the supervised machine learning life cycle, there are different stages of the pipeline in which questions related to social cultural diversity arise. So first, there are questions that relate to who influences the design and goals of the system. This relates to problem formulation, who defines what the goal of the system is. It also relates to the training data, when the labels that we're using come from human labelers, whose views and knowledge is being encoded. And related to problem formulation, there's also design choices. So who's choosing how the system is being designed? In addition to that, there are questions when we're thinking about the data itself, and there are questions of who's subjected to the algorithm. And this relates both to the training data and to the application of the algorithm, who's represented in the data, and when the algorithmic output is a subset, is a group, what, who's included in this group? What is the composition of this group? And finally, there's a question of who's affected by the deployment of the algorithm. This naturally includes those who are subject to the algorithm, but it's not restricted to this group. When an algorithm is deployed, it may affect beliefs, values, and configurations of social groups. And in this portion of the tutorial, we will take a close look at different stages and questions in this pipeline. So let's start with problem formulation and design. As I said, the first question we need to ask is who's defining the goal of the system? When thinking about what problem formulation entails, Mitchell and her, her co-authors give a great overview of the decisions that are involved in problem formulation. This includes what is the overarching goal? Also, what is the mechanism of entry into the population that will be subjected to the algorithm? And what is the space of possible decisions? Basically, when you think about why living in some space, what are the possible predictions and decisions that the algorithm may inform? This matters because algorithms that solve seemingly the same task can be embedded within entirely different problem formulations. So let's look at an example of what I mean by this. So here we have an example that says predicting student loan default for the University of Texas at Austin, the title of this work. And another work that the title is predicting and deterring default with social media information in peer-to-peer -peer lending. At a first look, we would say, well, the machine learning algorithm embedded in both these systems could be very similar. In both cases, the goal is to predict loan default. When we look closer, add the problem formulation in which the systems are embedded though. In the first case, one of the things that authors conclude is interventions that focus on student persistence and academic success were seen as the primary actions needed to help prevent student loan default. The authors of the second work concluded that tearing borrowers with social media stigma and shaming on online social media could be a low cost enforcement option for Chinese peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. So when we see what are the overarching goals of the system, and importantly, what is the space of possible decisions that the algorithm is going to inform, we see that these are very different. 
And importantly, the diversity of the team that is responsible for problem formulation matters. And in this regard, there are two important dimensions that are first, there's the ethical considerations that are, well, who gets a say? That has ethical implications. And when considering the epistemic considerations, we have the question of, well, who designs the system may impact the way that the problem formulation ends up looking like. And see that gave us a great overview of the different pathways through which these may happen. And this is, this is something that we'll circle back in a little bit, that it, it is crucial that when thinking about the fact that there are epistemic considerations for diversity, what are the pathways through which these will be impacted? So we'll circle back to these in a little bit. But before that, let's also look at how, how and why are concepts of diversity relevant here? So Sina placed a lot of emphasis on the fact that we need to look at concepts of diversity and how do we start applying this thinking into this context? So for instance, in many high stakes settings, when the deployment of algorithms concern the allocation of public resources, problem formulation often involves deliberative mini public and town halls. In the context of recidivism prediction, we've seen town halls across the US in many states that are precisely meant to gather communities' opinions on these systems. And depending on the state, it may or may not uh, significantly impact the decisions that are made about this. But what would different concepts look like here? So on one hand, we could think about a representative notion of what should be the diversity composition of these deliberative mini publics or town halls. Under a representative notion, there may be a motivation for a, a representative notion of diversity based on a, political motivations in a representative democracy. At the same time, if we're thinking about systems that are meant to predict recidivism, for instance, then a normic notion may have a strong grounding and motivation in that those who have been historically disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system should have a strong say and a strong presence in the composition of these groups. And so when we start thinking about the different concepts, we see how that can lead to very different compositions and desirable compositions of the groups that we are bringing together to hear um, their opinions on things like what should algorithms deployed in the criminal justice system consider. And in addition to these, while we're going through the pipeline and different questions that arise at each stage, there are interdependencies and complexities. In particular, diversity considerations at other stages of the pipeline may depend on the problem formulation. So when we're thinking about algorithmic output, right? So if the output of the algorithm is a subset, then there may be very different normic considerations and justifications associated to allocating goods or burdens. So what are the diversity related goals and concerns when we're choosing a cohort of students that will receive additional academic support? That is very different than the considerations that are associated to choosing a subset of individuals that will not be granted loans. Similarly, in training data, a representative notion and its validity may depend on what is the mechanism of entry into the population that will be subjected to the algorithm. There's also questions of who makes the sign choices. And this is very related to problem formulation, but often these choices can be made by different teams. So, Decisions that are involved in the sign choices are things like, what is the choice of the training data? What are the performance metrics that we want to optimize? What are the models that we consider from prediction? And what is different the siderata that we consider important of these models? And very often, the team and institution involved in problem formulation may be entirely different to the team responsible for system design. For instance, a city government may be in charge of the problem formulation and may subcontract an, another company, a company for algorithmic development. In this context, when thinking about the science choices, problem formulation, and social cultural diversity, as Sina pointed out, 
a big uh, point of discussion in recent years has been the importance of diversifying the workforce in AI. And this is in part motivated by, by ethical considerations, but also in part motiv motivated by epistemic considerations. And here, what I mean when I say epistemic considerations is when we say having a more diverse workforce is going to impact epistemic properties of the algorithms that are created, for instance, fairness related properties of the algorithms that are created, that's what we're talking about here. However, there's been recent work that looks at the question of biased programmers or biased data. And what the authors conclude is that there is no evidence that female minority and low implicit association tests engineers and engineers that scored low in the implicit association test exhibit lower bias or discrimination in their code. And we find that bias predictions are mostly caused by bias training data. So how do we reconcile these seemingly contradictory perspectives and results? Well, here is where the emphasis that a part one of the tutorial placed on the pathways of diversity impact becomes very relevant. So if we're thinking about social cultural diversity impacting an epistemic property of the algorithm, for instance, whether the algorithm algorithm is going to do better according to certain fairness related metrics, it is important to consider what are the pathways through which we think that impact will take place. And so when we're visiting this work, we, look at, we can look at which elements of the study design are fixed. So in particular, some elements that are fixed in this context are the general problem formulation of what is the goal of the algorithm? What is it trying to predict? What is the space of possible predictions? Uh, the data collection is also uh, in great part fixed. The evaluation metrics, uh, the obfuscation of the variable names. And this, by the way, is representative of some real world settings, right? This is constraining the team responsibilities in this way is realistic in terms of in many settings, we see these types of a uh, division of labor, power, and responsibilities across different teams. But once we think about pathways, we're able to reinterpret the findings of this work as showing us that diversity at a constrained stage of the pipeline is not sufficient to impact algorithmic properties. And here are some brief comments in terms of the notion of diversity that they're looking at is normic in the sense that it is based on the individual's identity and whether they are minority individuals in the, in, in the general population of engineers. However, this normic notion is not one that some theory may necessarily agree with in that identity alone, as they look at it, may not be enough without the political engagement. And so that is just looking at what type of diversity is being studied here. There's also the consideration that we're not looking at a pathway in which there's team involvement. So we're not saying what is the impact of having a different composition of the team involved in making these decisions. And so once we reinterpret these findings, we can understand that what they're showing and it's something that is very relevant because as I said, this division of labor is something that happens in many settings is that just diverse just saying, okay, we're gonna have diversity. What Sina concluded with at the end of, we cannot expect diversity magic in this context. And this is something that is important, both when stating the importance of diversity for epistemic reasons and when studying it, it is crucial that we, crucial that we consider the pathways through which diversity can impact the problem formulation and design choices. And so one of the things that this work shows us is when talking about diversifying the workforce in AI may have an impact, there are ways in which it may, and there are ways in which it may not. And so pathways are crucial here. Now we can go on to thinking about the training data. And so one of the elements of the training data is when we have labels that come from humans, there's still under the question of who influences the design and goals of the system, 
there's the question of whose views are being encoded, whose knowledge and whose beliefs are being encoded into the system. So when we learn from experts, who are we learning from? And here there's two main points that uh, we should take into account. The first one is that there is often no ground truth. What we have is heterogeneous expert assessment. And so, and this happens across domains, even in spaces where we think that uh, there is a notion of ground truth that there will be a lot of expert agreements on. But in reality, there's often a lot of disagreement in tasks for which we're collecting labels. And this should be understood in combination with the fact that the social cultural identity of the experts may impact their assessment. And here this comes from a standpoint theory perspective, right? And the second thing is that not only their assessment, not only when we're saying, okay, what is your assessment for this case? How would you label these? But also for observed outcomes that are mediated by experts. So when we're learning from an observed outcome, so we have the sense that this is not a human that is producing a label, it's something that we're observing. As an example, think of the outcome of a police encounter, the diversity of teams mediating that outcome, such as the police officers involved, may impact the outcome. And so here, recent work on diversity in law enforcement and the impact that that has on a police encounter outcomes is relevant. And so here I have, at this stage of the pipeline, I have more questions than answers for you, but I think that there's a lot of really interesting questions. The first one is that there's been a lot of research on how such cultural diversity relates to cognitive diversity, right? And here the question is, when we're encoding this knowledge into an algorithm, there's an added layer of we're having labelers, for instance, we're encoding their knowledge. And then how does that affect the outcome of the algorithm when we're using that knowledge to train a model, right? And so what, type, what notions of diversity become relevant here, especially when we're motivated by epistemic properties of the algorithm that is being trained? And questions like how does the compositions of labelers affect algorithmic outputs? And here we can also think differently in the context of when we have individual labelers versus when we have committees that are labeling, right? And so when we have committees that are labeling, suddenly the literature on relevant, the literature and diversity in teams becomes very relevant. And finally, there's the question of how do we start thinking about how to account for outcomes that are not directly labeled, but mediated? by experts. And also in the context of training data, we have the question of who's subjected to the algorithm. And so here we start with who's being represented in the training data. And there's been a lot of work in this space and the work in this space has thought about diversity from different perspectives and with the goal of answering different questions and using different definitions of what constitutes diversity. So some, um, some of the work in this space has looked, for instance, at the relationship between having a diverse data set and other properties of the algorithm that is trained on this data uh, such as fairness related properties and these uh, under specific mathematical definitions of diversity. Other work has looked at diverse data sets with a clear epistemic goal. So here it is, for instance, with the goal of improving generalizability of the system. And finally, there's other work that suggests a uh, thinking of diversity in machine learning as a desirable property in itself. So in this context, diversity is a goal in itself. And so when looking at the literature through, when trying to look at the literature through a unifying lens, a first element that is important to note is that when we think about, okay, what is a diverse data set? There is a frequent focus on metrics of diversity, but the machine learning literature has paid less attention to the concepts underlying these metrics. 
in particular, when we try to say, okay, the metrics that we're talking about, what are the underlying concepts, even if they're not being explicitly discussed, diversity as a representative notion is sometimes implied. And this is something that is very natural and intuitive to us from a machine learning perspective, is the fact that, well, we have a, pro a distribution, we have a sample, we want that sample to be representative. And so thinking of diversity as a, from a representative notion comes very natural from a perspective of statistical learning. However, in this context, the reference population and the justification for why that's the reference population is not always specified. And another notion that is very common, so Shannon entropy as a, a metric of diversity. So here's the Shannon entropy of the distribution over attribute values. It's also common, and these would correspond to an egalitarian notion. Then when looking at the goals and in terms of what are the motivations for diversity in the literature, uh, there is a variety of them. So there's diversity as a goal in itself. So it seems like a desirable property, right? It seems like I should be able to say, yeah, my data set is diverse. There's also diversity motivated by epistemic properties of the algorithm. Some of these may be elements such as generalizability. A lot of these has been connected to fairness oriented metrics. Although at the same time, the, um, the idea of trade-offs between fairness uh, properties of the algorithm and diversity has also been uh, discussed. So, when thinking about diversity in training data, what should we know and how can we bring what uh, Sina taught us in the first part of this tutorial into this conversation? So the first thing that is very important is that diversity is not a monolithic concept. So when thinking about is this data set diverse, that's not going to have a single answer. And so when asking the question, is this data set diverse or, or what is a desirable composition of my training data for the, if I have diversity considerations in mind, it doesn't only requires us to specify a metric so that we can measure it, but it also requires us to specify what is the underlying concept, right? And specifying an appropriate concept should be grounded on what are the political, epistemic, and ethical goals, right? So why is it that I'm caring about diversity in this context? I need to articulate that. And then based on that, I can say, okay, based on that, these are concepts that are relevant. And once we have concepts, we can go on to discuss metrics. And I'll talk a little bit more about this also in the context of algorithmic outputs. So when looking about an algorithmic output and impact, here, it's still related to the question of who's subject to the algorithm, but it's also relevant to who is affected by the deployment of the algorithm. And so the first question is who's included by the algorithm in an output, right? And so for instance, what should be the composition of the output displayed by a search engine? This is something that has been explored in the literature in machine learning as subset selection. And so in particular, these are a two works that have looked at diversity in subset selection from an overview perspective. And these papers in particular are recommended references that provide overviews and perspectives uh, on what, how should we think about diversity in subset selection. Interestingly, the diversity notions underlying these two words are very different. So when we look at Drawson co-authors, um, they provide a categorization of diversity metrics that looks at distance-based diversity measures, which are based on similarity between elements in the group. There's coverage-based diversity measures that are based on having a predefined set of attributes and then studying the coverage over that. Novelty-based measures of diversity that require saying, okay, in my focus group, who, who was there? 
who's there now, and then hybrids between these. And all of these can be understood uh, as within group notions of diversity, um, as opposed to comparative in which we would have a target or a reference distribution. Um, and there's a lot of, when if you read this paper, uh, which also provides great motivations of how it connects to different examples, uh, some of which at the beginning of Sina's talk you saw, there's a lot of motivations for why these may make sense. But then there is a question of how do I relate that to, for instance, in these work by Mitchell and co-authors, where they provide a normic grounding and propose a corresponding family of diversity metrics for it. And so uh, one exciting thing about this work is that as Sina pointed out, there has been less work on how to operationalize normic notions of um, diversity. And what this work does is it provides a family of metrics that of diversity metrics that correspond to a normic notion. And here two key things is you can start seeing a lot of the elements that came up in the broader um, review of the diversity literature in the ML context and thinking about, okay, how do we start thinking about um, normic notions? And in this case, what the author says is variety in the representation of individuals in an instance or set of instances with respect to sociopolitical power differentials. Here, greater diversity means a closer match to a target distribution, right? And in both cases, the authors highlight the importance of context for choosing metrics, right? The question arises though of how do we relate these two works and their proposed metrics? They're both providing overviews and kind of a way of looking at subset selection from a big picture that will make a lot of sense, but how do we articulate and create a dialogue between them? And here is we're thinking about concepts as intermediate steps between motivations and just the justifications of the, based on the context, why do we care about diversity in certain ways? And the metrics, having the concepts be an intermediate step between motivations and metrics can help us articulate and create a dialogue between the different families of metrics that have been proposed in the literature. I can also make it easier to have a conversation about how the motivations should be reflected in the metrics. So if we first define what the relevant concepts are or a hybrid notion that is desirable, because it can be a little bit hard to jump directly from, well, this is the context that I have. And so I think that Shannon entropy is the thing that I want versus thinking about, okay, based on the context, what is the concept that I care about? And based on that concept, I can then start looking at how that concept can be, can be related in different metrics, right? And then one point there is that usually you have a one to many, like for, the, for one A, Within one concept, you can have different metrics that, um, that relate to it. And you can start having hybrid notions, right? And so, um, for instance, in the in Mitchell, um, Mitchell and co-authors talk about how different choices for these values give rise to metrics with different meanings. And so, but thinking about the concepts as an intermediate step can help us articulate the conversation. And it helps us relate metrics and words across the literature. Finally, when considering who is affected by deployment, the deployment of the algorithm, it is naturally important that we consider who's subjected to the algorithm, but the impact of the algorithm extends beyond those who are subjected to it. And it can affect the beliefs, values, and configuration of social groups. So, when thinking about this and revisiting the question of what should be the composition of the output displayed by a search engine, when we revisit this question and we're not just thinking about who is who appears in the subset, which is an important question, right? If I'm, for instance, considering a, I am a, a rec, I'm helping recruiters, a, I'm building an algorithm for recruiters to find top candidates, right? 
and I want to display who they should consider hiring, it also obviously has impact on who appears in this that search and who doesn't, but the impact also ex uh, expands beyond that. Uh, and so for instance, if we consider would a representative notion be desirable, there's a lot of additional considerations that arise when we're thinking about what is the impact that the algorithm will have. And so in particular, questions that arise when we think about the impact of the algorithm is how do algorithm allocations shape society, right? So when we're using algorithm, algorithmic allocations, what will be the impact of these beyond those receiving or not receiving the allocations? And importantly, when we consider algorithmic impact, this is relevant beyond algorithms in which the data itself corresponds to people. For instance, when we're thinking about algorithms and misinformation, so even in cases where there's no one that is subjected to the algorithm, the algorithm itself may shape composition of social groups that are exposed to it. And so to summarize, and before we go on to Q&A, we've highlighted how social cultural diversity is relevant throughout the ML lifecycle and propose a set of questions that are relevant to different stages of the pipeline. We highlighted how when considering epistemic properties of diversity in problem formulation and design, it is fundamental to consider pathways and be very specific about this. And when considering diversity in data and in teams, concepts of diversity can provide a way of connecting motivations and justifications with metrics of diversity. Thank you very much. Now we will go on to the Q&A. Thanks. Uh, uh, I should say some, some things that uh, came up in the Q&A. Uh, so some people asked for slides and readings. Uh, we are putting together a website uh, to put uh, up some of the core concepts and some of the core readings and resources uh, that we discussed in the talk. And, we are hoping to also have a, a review paper on archive soon. So uh, if you can bear with us, we will share it on our, I suppose, like Maria Twitter or something. We will uh, release information for where this website is, but hopefully there you can find uh, some of these core uh, papers uh, that we've been discussing. Okay, so uh, let's get to some of the questions. So one question was, uh, I think, by Bogdana, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was about uh, what is the relationship between diversity and other concepts that we might care about, such as inclusion or fairness. Uh, do you want to start, Maria? So the question is, how do we think about di relating diversity to concepts such as fairness? Yeah, so I think that one of the elements that um, thinking about diversity at different stages of the pipeline. Um, here, when thinking about, for instance, we care if we care about diverse, uh, fairness related properties of the algorithm, and that is our motivation for having a notion of a diverse data set, right? There, that, for instance, thinking about machine. Placing this in the context of machine learning leads to important questions such as, well, suddenly a representative notion of diversity doesn't necessarily make sense if our goal is we're optimizing overall performance of the algorithm, right? Because we know that that will not, that, that will hurt anyone who belongs to a minority group. And one thing that I think is helpful, uh, at least for me, when thinking about concepts of diversity is that when we think about diversity as a monolithic concept, and we think about the fact that diversity is a goal in itself, we can think that, oh, we need the data set to be diverse. And if we think that diversity means that it is representative, then we say, well, the data needs to be this way for it to be diverse, that is a goal in itself. And so suddenly a tension arises between diversity and fairness considerations. But when we, are in a position in which we can question, well, why is it that diversity as a representative notion makes sense? What is the motivation for that? Why, do, why is the justification? And we can see that 
well, there may be no justification for having a representative notion of diversity in the training data, that leads to a space in which diversity considerations and fairness considerations can go hand in hand. Like there's no necessarily a trade-off or a tension between them, because if the reason why we care about a diverse training data is for fairness-related properties of the algorithm, for instance, then notions of egalitarian um, diversity or normic notions of diversity may be more relevant. And you probably have stuff to add to this, Ina. Yes, uh, I have some stuff to add, but uh, I think we, we are, given that we are a bit short of time, I, I think you uh, hit all the core points. And to just uh, to add that, I will just add that uh, also fairness is a very uh, complex notion itself. So depending on how you de define fairness, whether you have a very local perspective uh, versus uh, kind of as procedural view, or like you think fairness is a matter of social justice, there's also that complication as well. Uh, uh, Oshnish, I, I, I hope that I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry, I apologize if I'm uh, mistaken. I uh, had a number of questions. I think many of these questions are about uh, 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 cognitive diversity, Scott Page's work on the business case for diversity, as well as uh, why organizations uh, are still so resistant uh, to this business case. Uh, or why are AI teams? Uh, so uh, first, uh, one thing I should say, Scott Page has done some very great work about uh, cognitive diversity and about the different ways that it can, I should say, can as opposed to does. Uh, it can benefit uh, team performance across tasks like problem solving, prediction, uh, and certain decision-making tasks, estimation. Uh, I suggest thinking about these things as more as uh, the epistemic benefits of, or the knowledge or the performance benefits of diversity as opposed to the business case for them because business case, as I said, comes with a particular framing that uh, kind of frames these uh, re results about the benefits, the cognitive benefits of diversity in terms of uh, that it must, so diversity must be valued because of these things. But okay, let's say that uh, nonetheless, we think that we are making the business case so that the businesses are happy and they think that uh, this is uh, diversity, diversifying their workforce is something that they should do. Why is it that they don't do it? I have different <laughs> answers uh, on different levels of optimism and pessimism. Uh, diversity, many of these uh, things show that diversity can like under experimental condition in certain settings, uh, as I uh, discussed in, in certain contexts, uh, be beneficial. But to for these benefits to come first, it's not guaranteed. The timeline, time horizon for uh, when these benefits come is sometimes unclear. And I think most importantly, it be, depends on the organizational context. Uh, it depends on a commitment meaningful commitment to justice and inclusion. Uh, because otherwise, if you're just in a context that these things are neglected, these benefits don't come. And uh, I think even a Scott Page in certain cases, they are hoping to use this business case as a way to motivate people to act in a different way. I don't know how successful they are, but my pessimistic reading sometimes is that it requires commitment. And again, I uh, end by suggesting the piece by Catherine Phillips who notes that some of these difficulties that arise in interactions in uh, demographically diverse groups are actually very, very similar to the challenges that arise in the context of uh, cross-functional teams, teams that come from different disciplines. They also sometimes don't trust each other completely or they also have uh, interaction differences. And Catherine Phillips uh, like poses this question to us, like why is it that we think this, that interdisciplinary teams are valuable and some businesses think that these things are not valuable. And I suggest that you uh, also look at that piece because it's a fantastic piece and uh, really places this discussion of business case and questions our assumptions about it. Uh, all right, I think uh, we have to leave uh, and uh, because uh, <laughs> Uh, we are running out of time and the next tutorial is starting, but please uh, feel free uh, to contact us. I mean, I don't want to, maybe Maria doesn't mind it, but I think 
No, so, absolutely. And yeah. we can also continue the conversation on Circle. Oh, yeah. So Circle has a channel for the tutorial. And so we can continue chatting about this throughout the conference there. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you everyone.